So um, I've had this uh, device simulation sent in and um, the person who sent it in said they're having some difficulty fitting uh, their experimental data to the, to, the, to the solar cell. So I thought what I'd do is just make a, a live video of me effectively um, trying to fit the experimental data to this device and sort of seeing what problems I come up with as I do this and then ultimately hopefully trying to, to fit the experimental data. And what's slightly um, interesting about this device is actually quite a long long device in one dimension and, um, and uh, very narrow in the other di uh, direction. Nominally, it's a, a P3 PCBM device, but I don't think that's the actual material that, that it's made of. I think it's something else. So if we look at the device size, it's actually 2.5 meters long and, um, and um, you know, a centimetre or so, or so wide. So it's sort of unusual from that perspective. Um, so this is what's been sent in. I, I haven't really looked at the simulation yet. So we're just going to go ahead and try and fit um, the experimental data to it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to run a simple JV curve. So I'll make sure the simulator's in JV mode, which it is. I'll run a JV curve and let's just see what it kicks out. So let's look at jv.dat. And this is the JV curve we get. So the first thing you notice about it is it's sort of got negative voltages, which is super weird. Um, we've got sort of sensible currents coming out down here, but it's sort of negative voltages. So um, one thing that could cause this could be the series resistance. So if we just go and check the value of series resistance, whoops, that's not series resistance, uh, this series resistance. So we're just going to check the value of uh, series resistance. Uh, just check we're still recording, um, and, and have a look what it is. So we'll see it's set at 19.5 ohms. Now the thing is, this is this series resistance. Um, so I'll just get up a picture of, of of a solar cell. So where can I get that? If we go, here's a picture of a solar cell. So this series resistance is effectively this this resistor here, and it's literally a resistance. It's not a resistance per unit area. It's it's actually a resistance. So the voltage drop over there will be um, current coming out of your solar cell times voltage. So in, in this case, the special thing about this device is a very large area. So um, it's going to be producing a lot of current. So if you have, for example, um, one amp times 27, that's going to be a voltage drop of 27 volts. So that's probably not realistic um, for such a big solar cell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop that value down to a much lower value of, say, 0.1, um, and, and rerun the simulation and have, and have a look at it. Again, so let's have a look at the JV curve. There we go, and that seems sort of more, more sensible. So we've got now, now voltage ranges between um, 0 and, and 1.0. Well, 1.0. And what that value of um, uh, series resistance does is literally just sort of modeling that, uh, that voltage drop over the contacts. So you wouldn't want the voltage drop over that to be very big. So the bigger your solar cell gets, the smaller that number really, really needs to, to go. OK, so that, that's, that's that sorted. Um, now let's try and look at the experimental data that uh, we had that, that got that got sent in. So um, there's already some experimental data in the model. I'm not I'm not sure what that, that is in the simulation. So we'll, we'll just go ahead and reload in our, our experimental data to make sure we've we've got it. So we'll open a data file, and I happen to know, I've already put it on my desktop as a text file. So it's called JV uh, curve fourth quadrant. Whoops, fourth quadrant. Um, and this is the data file. So what you notice about it is a bit of a messy data file in that it's got sort of, it's actually experimental data. Um, so it's got sort of repeat values of zeros. So you've got sort of you know, repeat values in here that you might not need. Um, and it's, it's, it's probably not sort, sorted. And it is, uh, the, the X scale is actually reversed. So it goes from positive value to negative. So it's actually quite messy. So we'll make sure, so this column we know is voltage. And this column I happen to know is um, amps per meter squared. So this is voltage, this is amps per meter squared. And this is a file that, that we, um, GPVDM has imported. Or, or, and it, you see it's stripped out all those extra values. And we get left with, with sort of a nice clean data. It's also sorted. It's in the correct order. So if we go ahead and import that data, and there we go, there's our data. Um, let's just run a single simulation, a single fit simulation, see how it goes. So um, what have we got now? We've got... The experimental data is this line, and the simulation is this line. Okay, this still looks slightly odd. Um, why is this? Let's have a look. Because this, this simulation line is flat, um, and it, it probably shouldn't be. Um, let's go back and look at the JV curve again. Hmm. 
that looks vaguely sensible. Let's look at these parameters here. I mean, we've got a... So the first thing I noticed, we've got a, a band gap here of 1.9 EV. And if this was a P3HD PCBM cell, um, probably expect a bang up about what about 1.1 EV. Uh, now let's look at the, this. This this looks odd. This um, recombination rate constant. So this is this is recombination. So this is electron hole recombination. I mean, you you must have recombination happening on your device. So this this value can't be zero. Um, so let's just set it to one to the minus twenty. I think that's quite a low value. Maybe maybe to nineteen. That's better. Um, these, this is the value of effective density of free electron states, uh, 1 to 27, 1 to 25. I mean, those are asymmetric. Um, there's probably no real reason to have them asymmetric, especially as we haven't got much data about this particular device. So let's just set it to sort of a, a generic value, which I usually do as 5 to 26. Whoops. So that's all sort of a very generic value for that. We've got no traps, so all these parameters don't matter. Mobility looks sensible. Um, this all looks sensible. Um, so let's also look at the charge on the contacts. So 1 to 25, that also seems sensible. So let's run that again. Have a look at it. Yeah, I mean, that probably looks a lot better. Um, let's try and fit that again. And yeah, that sort of looks more sensible than that we've got. Um, we've got the experimental data there and we've got, we've got some type of um, JV curve there. And the reason the blue line was flat before was effectively because they're, they're just on different scales. I, I, I expect the, um, the JV curve, the simulated JV curve, was just sort of you know, either very, very positive or very, very negative compared to the um, the experimental data, so that's why it looked flat. It was just sort of how you're looking at it with the graph. Um, if you, uh, if if you're sort, of, yeah, okay. Um, now let's look at this com this fit configure option and just make sure it all looks sensible. So this fits enable. That means we're going to do this fitting. Um, we're going to multiply all the errors in these graphs by one, and that that's a useful function if you're going to be doing like many different multi-parameter fits. Um, we've got start start voltage of zero, so that makes sense. Stop voltage of one, just just over VOC, probably also makes sense. Um, do we apply log log axes to these scales? Not really, doesn't make sense because it's a light JV curve. And subtract the lowest point. That just means we need to normalise everything down here to zero, so that forces this point to zero. Um, I'm tempted to start the fit. However, what, what I what I do know is that this is, this isn't actually a P3H T P C M device. So I suspect um, the band gap is going to be slightly higher um, because it, I think it's a, a novel polymer. So I'm just going to pop the band gap up slightly. And the reason I'm doing this is because you can see the point here where, where the where the experimental data where the VOC is. It sort of starts to pick up here. Um, in experimental data is here, and in the simulated data is down here. So it, the idea when you're doing a fitting is to try and get the curves sort of by, by hand, manually as close to each other as you can, and then let the fitting have a go at it. Because the fitting's not sort of super intelligent, it's just an algorithm. So the better you line it all up to start with, the better chance you have of doing it. So what I'm going to do is just pop this up to one point, I'd say 1.3. Um, I don't can't remember what your bang up of the polymer is. Um, of course, it's Lumo fullerene. Um, minus homo of, uh, poly of polymer, so it's it's not the band gap of the polymer, obviously. And that looks a lot better. Um, we could probably play with mobility a bit more to, to make it line up a bit more. So I don't know, what we, may, maybe drop mobility down a little bit. Um, and then, should we run that again? So I'll just drop the whole, so yeah, that's, that's, that's not looking too super bad. So this is also set up ready to go. So I'm just going to run one iteration and see see how it, how, how, it, how it likes it. And we can look at the fit progress here. And we're already starting to line up a bit. It doesn't look super terrible. And I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to probably run the whole process of fitting it because it's quite fiddly and time consuming. I mean, you'll get the idea of how, how it works. I'll, do, I'll sort of play with it a bit more and, um, and we'll see where we get to. So you see it's sort of fitting it away. 
um, look at the fit progress of the errors. This is the fit error that's going down. Oh, there's not, not too bad down there. I'm a bit concerned about this region here, although it may, it may get it. Um, because you see sort of this curve here is taking off here. It's sort of increasing in magnitude, suddenly starts increasing magnitude about there. And this starts increasing magnitude here. So there's sort of two distinct slope regions. And it's probably going to find that quite hard to, to line up. Although it seems to be not doing a bad job. If we look at the fit progress. Yeah, it's still trundling down there. That's not bad. Now what tends to happen at some point, the fit tends to sort of stagnate and stop. Um, oh, although it's not doing that. And what, 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 what it'll, it'll probably do it in a second. Um, it'll sort of level out and flatten out there. And if it does that, um, basically just stop the fit and, and have another go at restarting. Oh, so, so actually this, this isn't doing too super badly. Um, yeah, and this is of course, the red line is the error here, so just minimizing the error. Yeah, so it's starting to flatten out here. No, it's not. That's doing quite well, actually. And if it does flatten out, what, what I generally, and stop, stop the fit stops improving, what I generally tend to do is go into the experimental parameters, adjust them a bit, and try and sort of shift the curve by hand, um, and then have another, let it have another go at fitting. But in this case, it seems to be doing relatively well. Um, yeah, so let's just look at the, the, the device parameters and see how they're changing through fitting. Oops. Yeah, so we can watch the device parameters change here as it's fitting. Now, sometimes here you get, um, and it's just playing, you can see it's just playing with the mobilities really. Um, sometimes here you get negative numbers, and you might think, oh, well, negative mobility, you know, that's totally crazy. Why do you have negative mobility? Um, the reason is, so, so the reason is effectively the model, when it reads in any, any parameter, I'll just have a look at how the fit's doing. I, I think we're basically done, almost. I'm going to call that done for this example. We can probably let it go a bit more, but uh, that's good. I think that's good enough for today. Um, so if we look at the, these these parameters, some, as I was saying, sometimes you get sort of negative values pop up in here through the fitting, you, and you might think, oh, a negative mobility. What does that mean? Well, all all it when the model reads in all these parameters, it takes the absolute value of them. So if it reads in a negative mobility, it turns into a positive value. And, if, and it's quite clever in doing that. So any of these parameters absolutely should be positive. It will, it will realize a negative value makes no sense. Just take the absolute value of it. So um, why do these negative um, values appear during the fitting? Well, they appear um, because, uh, because, some, some because it's easier to let, or it's numerically more efficient to let the fitting algorithm explore a negative space, but then model then take the absolute value of that number, um, rather than disallowing um, with sort of hard limit um, negative numbers. That, that sort of, so you end up with a very, um, sort of theor theoretically you end up with a very high gradient um, of, of, of sort of error zero if you try and ban negative numbers. So it's much better just to let it explore the negative space, but then any number that's read in gets turned to a, a, a positive number. And that's it really. So that's sort of a little example of how to, I guess, how to debug and, and fix uh, solar cell models. So I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you found it useful. Thank you very much.